Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. And I sure wish I could remember the talk I was giving on the way up. It was great. So somebody asked me, Dale's going to keep me, keep making me come back here until I get this thing right. So you'll probably see me once every other year. But you know, I love Alcoholics Anonymous and I love being sober. This is the only thing that I've ever participated in my life where I stuck to it. You know, I was involved in a lot of things, but I was kind of a, 50-yard or 25-yard runner, and I always entered in the 100-yard dash, and I never won anything. Because I was scared to win anyway, because then they would expect it again. But you know, the, the theme of the 12 steps is the joy of living, and action's the magic word. But I think, uh, conversely, I think it's really the joy of giving. The more you give, the more you get. And I have a quiet satisfaction about myself that this program really works. And when I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous, I was convinced that life doesn't work. For certain people, you come off the assembly line, and he says, okay, sucker, no matter what you do, it ain't going to work, so don't try. And when I got here, I came out of a nut house, and I was convinced that nothing was going to work. And this, a program like this surely wouldn't, especially when you go to your first meeting and all the ladies are talking about God taking them on and off the freeway. And I said, oh, shit, what's this? You know, I didn't want it. It was the longest hour I ever put put in in my whole life. But I stayed long enough to find out that I had a right to be a person. You know, until I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't think it was right to be me. I thought there was something wrong that I was always out of step. Because I could hear it all my life. You're noted for your blunders. Everybody knew me for my blunders. And I got to the point where I was totally a non-participant in life. I was just existing. And I was to the point where I couldn't live in the present. I was always in the past. But I've stayed here long enough to realize that this whole thing is an inside job. And ultimately, I'm responsible for my own inner development. I spent many years waiting for everything to come from the outside in. You know, I'd go to the psychiatrist's office and sit there waiting for him to open the, a drawer and hand me a pill that's going to make me well. I'd go in week after week with great anticipation and walk away empty. And when I came here and I made that discovery that it was all right to be me, but the hard part was I found out that I have to be responsible for my own inner development. That means there's a candle that's lit inside of me that I'm responsible to keep the flame going. And one of the ways I do that is by participating in Alcoholics Anonymous. As we were talking early, the one thing you can't store is awareness. You know, because I was the last to know and I'd be the first to forget. And I've done enough hospital institution work and then enough detox centers to see many, many former AA members. And you'd always ask them, what happened? Well, I stopped going to meetings. I got bored. I didn't like to hear these same old stories. And you'd ask them, well, did you pray on the day that you drank? And nine times out of ten, they'd call you a son of a bitch. Because they didn't. They stopped praying. And I don't know how you can get bored in Alcoholics Anonymous if you stay in the present. I'm absolutely convinced without a doubt that if you realize you only have a daily reprieve, and it's contingent on a spiritual attitude or a not a spiritual attitude as much as a spiritual condition. And you have to work on that one. And I think if the joy of living translates to the joy of giving, the gold givers are the ones that get. If you came here expecting to take, you're going to go away empty. But if you came here to contribute to the 43rd anniversary, you're going to go away full no matter what happens. Just a little bit you do. You know, we have a a couple down there, they lost a a little baby one time, and I took every ounce of strength 
that I had to go to the, the church, to the memorial, because I knew both couples. They came out of the Haight-Ashbury living together, got married, got jobs, and had this beautiful little baby, and it was a crib death, you know. And I really worried about going and what are you going to say and that. And the minister happened to know the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he picked up our book, and he says, you're not going to find the answer in this blue book. And he picked up the Bible, and he says, you're not even going to find it there. The only thing you can do is by your presence you show him you love him. And that was big relief. And sometimes that's all we can do is be present to help people. Now, I didn't get this far overnight. You know, I didn't wake up one morning and say, whoopee, I'm an alcoholic. Let's go to Alcoholics Anonymous. It took a long time. And as I said earlier, I really didn't think this was the answer because if life don't work, how is this going to work? But I had heard that if you keep on keeping on until you catch on to what we're doing, you'll find a way of life here that doesn't compare to any anything else in the world. Now, my drinking career, well, somebody was asking me the other night uh, how exciting was it. Well, the most exciting thing that I have ever done in my drinking career was I got lost in my own bedroom. <laughs> I came home at Christmas time, and nobody was there. And I said, Ran in, just made it to the bed and flopped, and it was a silky thing on top of the bedspread, and I rolled underneath, and there I was for about seven hours, and calling the police, the hospitals, everything else, and I come sauntering out about seven hours later. There wasn't too many people very happy with me. That's about the most exciting thing I ever did. But where I was born and raised in Buffalo, New York, and back there, everybody drank. There was no, nobody that I knew that didn't drink. There was one neighbor and everybody was very suspicious of them because they didn't drink. Nothing. But everybody drank. And I never attached any of the problems I ever had to drinking. I went in the Navy when I was 16 years old. and Everybody at that time was uh, being drafted at 21. It was the same thing. Well, he's a little wild. And that's what I thought it was. And it was a funny thing happened. To, at the same time when I first started drinking, I got deathly ill on somebody's wine that we stole from somebody's father's cellar. We broke in and got it, and I got deathly ill. And it, we were smoking. Some guy had a panel truck. And we'd clip off the cigarettes we found on the street and roll them all. And I got really sick from smoking, and I never smoked again. But the drinking, I was always willing to pay the price. And I would always think it was mixing the drinks or this and that. And it went on. I was always very careful so that I wouldn't get these terrible hangovers and getting sick. But I was always willing to pay the price. And, you know, I got in a lot of trouble in the Navy, but it was during the war, so I got out of a lot of trouble. And after the war, the, when I came home, everybody was older than I was. I just was barely 20 when I had four years in. And the other guys had got drafted in 1939, so they were all in their early 30s. And my brother took a job as a bartender so he wouldn't have to go back to the rubber mill. And one night I was come in on a Saturday was the big night, right? So I come sauntering up to the bar and I ordered a beer and he hands me three bucks and says, why don't you go and drink down the street? I couldn't figure out what the hell is he doing. But it turns out I'm a pain in the ass and he didn't want me in the bar where he was working. He preferred I'd be someplace else. I found out that's 86, but I didn't know that till many years later. But then, you know, I get married and no particular problems there. A lot of illnesses and sicknesses with the kids and my wife. And, but all the things that were going on in my life, never attached to drinking to it. There was always a lack of it. And I was working at one place and part-time with my in-laws and breaking into my father-in-law's cellar and stealing homemade Italian wine. Always. I was the first one, well, either to throw up or do something stupid. You could always depend on me ruining birthdays, Christmas, New Year's, funerals, weddings. I always wanted to just have a good time. I never really intended to screw anything up. I was just going to go and have a good time. But I never thought I had a capacity for drinking. But it turned out as I always had such a head start, I didn't have a capacity. When I got there, I was already mostly gone. And it wouldn't really take much. Everybody said, you can't really drink at all. You can't hold it. But I never told anybody how much I had before I got there. I came up with a bright idea that if we leave Buffalo, New York, and 
and moved to California, all my problems would be behind me. Get rid of all those in-laws, and I won't have them sticking their nose in my business all the time. I won't have to work two jobs. Everything would be great. But the only thing that changed in, when I got to California is I stopped drinking beer because I found out it was only 3.2. Then I started drinking wine and mixed drinks. And then when my family finally got out here, instead of the house being full of in-laws, every time there was a problem, it was full of cops. And I was always saying, who called these guys? What's wrong? Was there a robbery? I never knew what was going on. I was always out of step. And I was doing a lot of traveling with the company. And I loved that part of the job. In fact, if you were working on a project with me, it was really your project, and there was a trip involved, you can bet I'm going to screw you out of it. Because I'd get on the plane, and the first thing I'd do wherever we went is I'd cancel the trip back home. So that means I have to come home first class. And always come home on a Friday morning, and there's never no room in coach. You always have to come first class. And I loved that. And then I developed the thing when we were going to Oklahoma City, two jobs. I was turning in one expense account that would go through my boss and another expense account that would go through marketing. I had a nice little part-time job. And I was always taking these guys. So I didn't make many friends. Because if you work hard on a project, and the, the little goody you did is the trips. And I was taking because you guys are too valuable. You better stay here in the office and... If I get involved in your project, I'm going to just screw it up anyway. So this is the way I operated. But I started at this period of time of getting physically ill. I go to this doctor and that doctor. Nobody could really figure out what was wrong. Most of all, I couldn't. And I did ask about drinking, but I never heard an alcoholic yet that would have cop out to any more than, well, I have a couple of drinks every now and then. That's all. I never told anybody really how much it was, and I don't think... I knew how much it was. And we'd get visitors in from out of town. First thing I said, boy, we should take them to the city. We should take them here for lunch and all that. I love to have visitors from out of town because then I could drink legally. Because, you know, you're you're entertaining the customers, so it's all right to make an ass of yourself. But then I kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker. In fact, we made one trip to Tokyo. If we'd have met the people from Oklahoma at San Francisco International, and talked to him for five minutes in the bar. We could have did the whole job. And when we got to Tokyo, I bled it for three weeks. But if my partner wouldn't have got homesick, we'd have stayed over there two more weeks at least. And that's the way I operated. I even was so dumb, I stayed a whole weekend in Oklahoma. <laughs> I figured the thing out so well, I had to stay till the following Monday. And all these kind of things. And it just kept going, but I kept getting sicker and sicker. And another thing I was getting is scared. I was actually good at my job at one time. There were people calling up from all over the country asking questions on this logistics stuff that I was doing. But I never had the feeling inside of me that I knew what I was doing. I always felt insecure. I had a superior attitude, but what I was doing was covering up a deeply rooted inferiority complex. See, I would be very claustic. First guy with the jab, and I'd jump on you before you had a chance to jump on me. But if you ever came in and got to me first, I would have picked up my pencil and left. And I kept getting scareder and scareder. And I lost the ability to live in the present. I was either reminiscing and crying in my beer because World War II came along and ruined my athletic career. And I wouldn't have had one anyway, but you couldn't have told me that when I was drinking. Or I was living way out into the future, but I could not live in the present. I hated Wherever I was, I just didn't want to be there. And I did kept getting sicker and then going to this guy and that guy. And nobody could figure out what was going on. And then I started missing, naturally, Mondays and Tuesdays and hold on Thursdays. So Fridays, maybe I would come to work. But I'd get there just in time for coffee break so I could sneak across the street and then wait for lunch hour and wait for after Fridays. And then the weekend was gone and there comes Monday again. That's the way the life was going. And one of these times when I was hiding in the bedroom with the flu, that we, I really got a lot of flu. I was terribly weak. and Every time I turned around, I was homesick with the flu. In fact, one time I came back after one of my uh, two or three days off because this was car problems. And the little girl from Taiwan says, how many carburetors does a car have? I says, only one. She says, you realize this is the sixth one you put on this year? 
She was keeping track of how many times my car. I had to find a new part of the car to break down. But I kept getting sicker. And then one of these times, then they brought some food into me in the bedroom, and I went down and came right back up. And my body swelled up and got as hard as this podium. And they rushed me over to El Camino Hospital in Mountain View. And the first guy that looked at me wanted to take out my appendix. And then fortunately, there was a young guy working, and he had done all his uh, pre-med in New York City in the county hospitals. And the minute he looked at me, he knew what it was. And what it was is I had an acute tack of pancreatitis. And it had backed up into my system, and the only thing that was working was barely the heart and the lungs. I was in intensive care for 11 days. The first five days, the fever was over about 104, 105. They couldn't break it. And I was in the hospital for 38 days. And you know the word alcohol, alcoholism or alcoholic never came up. And nobody came by and said, hey, dummy, you're laying in that bed dying because you drank. There was one nurse tried to. But she really didn't know how to approach it, and I didn't understand until I come to Alcoholics Anonymous what she was trying to do. The only one that called me an alcoholic was my ex-wife. And I said, well, you always say that. You know, and I said, it wouldn't be for your big mouth, I wouldn't have to drink. She says, it wouldn't be for your drinking, I wouldn't have a big mouth. So we weren't going anywhere with that one. But I walked away from that hospital with the idea that I was a diabetic. Because I must be a diabetic, they gave me a diabetic diet. Because that goes with pancreatitis. But you know that uneasiness came back. And I was home three or four days or five days and the phone started ringing. And all these questions from work started coming up. And then every one of these guys I intimidated, insulted with my caustic remarks or bullied around Every little mistake they found, they ran in, and they were telling the boss about it. So he was building a nice case, and the phone kept ringing. See, I can't spell. I don't have a high school education, and I'm running a group of six college graduates. So I didn't write nothing down. If I did, you couldn't have read it anyway, because I had my own pig Latin that I used. And I had 38 active projects going, and the only one that knew the shape of any of those was me. Everything was up there. I could go to a meeting of, say, 10 or 15 people, and I can't take notes because I can't read them if I take them anyway. And two or three weeks later, I could tell you exactly what everybody said in that meeting, even if it lasts for an hour. I had developed that kind of a memory. I had to remember this stuff because I didn't want to let anybody get ahead of me. But they kept running into the boss with all these their different things. I'm trying to stick to the diet that they gave me, but I'm getting scared and scared. See? My fear was the fear of being found out. You know, I worked so hard to work it up to seem to be something that I wasn't. And the only one that knew that I wasn't what everybody thought was me. And it was eating me up inside. And I had this image, and I wanted to protect it. Oh, when you're home dying, and everybody's running in and telling the boss all this little chicken shit stuff you've been doing all the time, there you're going to be found out. And I said, getting scared her and scared her. And I was getting, so I could hardly sit. And the phone would ring and I'd almost jump up because they found out. Now everybody's going to know that I'm a big phony. So finally I couldn't handle it anymore. And I asked the doctor to let me go back to work. He let me go back about a month or so before he really wanted me to go. On the promise that I'd only stay four hours. Well, I walked back into that place on a Monday into a hornet's nest that I created. But you couldn't have told me it was my fault. I called everybody every name you could think of and dumb college assholes if you'd only done what I told you and all this, these things wouldn't happen. Well, the jobs got off the track because we're in a meeting with the government and I'm not paying attention because I'm looking at the clock and I'm waiting for a coffee break or somebody call a recess or why doesn't somebody get in a fight and throw the contractors out so I can sneak across the street and get well. And these guys are agreeing to things that was impossible to do, but the only one that would know it would have been me if I'd have paid attention. And them were the kind of things and the kind of trouble that I was getting into. But fortunately, I was able to catch up pretty, pretty well. Because I did one thing. I took care of the people that worked for me. 
They got the best raises, and they were isolated. Nobody picked on anybody that worked for me because they didn't want my rant. They didn't realize what a phony I was and how scared I was. I'd give people raises that didn't deserve them just so I wouldn't have to have the confrontation and telling you you did a shitty job. I'd just give you a raise so you wouldn't holler at me. And all these kind of things. I was worried. I was scared of everybody. Newspaper boys, gas station attendants, grocery clerks, anybody could intimidate me. But I got on the train and got off in Sunnyvale and I had these pains behind my neck and in my stomach. And, oh, they really found out now. And I didn't know what to do. So the thought occurred to me that, well, hell, I must have been drunk is the way I am. So I walked into there and I took a drink. And I stepped back because they told me for me to drink is to die. And I said, well, what's the difference? I'm dead anyway. So I took the drink and nothing happened. The pains went away from behind my neck and in my stomach. I only had the one, so I went down the street, got to the signal, and I'm congratulating myself. Every time you get up tight, get a couple of belts, and things would be fantastic. Walked right in the liquor store and bought two of them little cans. The next day it was two drinks and a half a pint, and the third day the cheapness come back. I figured on two drinks, I could have got a whole half pint for what I paid for them, two drinks. And from that time, somewhere in 1968 or 69, I don't even remember, until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous on January 19, 1972, total blackout, like Hogan's Heroes, the Vietnam War, all that stuff. I never seen any of those until it came on. And my kids tell me I sat in front of the TV all the time. I have no recall because I was obsessed with getting it, hiding it, getting to it and drinking it and trying not to show it. And in my mouth, when I drink, is like Buddy Hackett's. My head curls. And the minute it starts curling, everybody's, uh-oh, where is it? You know, and they start running all over, you know. Most of us people who have a lot of Irish in us, we have a lot of diarrhea of the mouth when we're sober. So you can imagine when I'm drinking what it was like. So they're looking. So I had to get more clever on the places to hide it. And I'm trying to get a hold of the money, which is another big problem. I was working Saturdays telling my family i got to catch up on all the months I was off, but they can't pay me. And I'm telling my boss i got to work to catch up, and he's paying me. So that was the only money I was getting. If I... You sent me the story, you never got any change. But the hardest thing was getting rid of the dumb empties. What do you do with the empties? Because somebody's allowed to look in your garbage and run in and tell your wife you're drinking. Well, the only one that didn't know that nobody knew that I was drinking was me. Everybody else knew that I was doing it. So needless to say, I woke up one day in the psych ward at Hulu Pavilion. That was before treatment centers. So now the psychiatrist is going to cure me by curing my family. And I certainly agreed to that. I knew it was their fault anyway. So I don't know how many times, how you know how long I was in there, but I finally got released and we're going to these sessions and I finally told everybody, you know, if you people don't shut up when we go talk to this guy, we're never going to get done and it's costing $35 an hour. I never understood what I was supposed to be doing in there. The only thing is, like I said in the beginning, I kept waiting for the magic answer or the magic pill. When is he going to do something to help me? And I walked away every time. I'd go with great anticipation of being helped. Nothing would happen. So I took the antibuse, threw it in the toilet, got a vitamin C that was the same size, and put it into the prescription bottle. And every morning the kids would crush up vitamin C in the ice cream, and they think they're feeding me antibuse. And I went back to drinking. Because that's the only thing I knew to do. That's the only time that it felt like anything is when I was drinking. That's the only time I could get peace of mind. It's the only time that anything would happen. But, you know, you just can't go in and sit in a bar anymore because everybody, at least in the neighborhood where I live, knows I'm not supposed to be drinking. My ex-wife made sure they knew that. Everybody at work knows you're not supposed to be drinking because they've been to the hospital when I was dying. They've been to the nut house to see me. Everybody knows I'm not supposed to be drinking. So I'm sitting in the ballpark at 10 o'clock at night watching guys play softball put a bottle of Fresca or next to the density dumpsters or go to the supermarket and open up the trunk and they pretend you're doing something in there while you're pouring a vodka and squirt. Squirt used to have that creamy color so they wouldn't tell how much you had and then I'd eaten lemons and 
peanuts and swallowing Listerine to keep the son of Eden. No. The only one that didn't know was me. And it's going on and on again, the same thing, missing work. They finally took that job away from me. And a really, you know, that they say that we're alcoholics are super sensitive. We hurt easy and we don't suffer well. So I'm sitting in my cubicle. They put me off on a job that nobody worked on in four years. That's how important it was. You know, I could have sent my time card in. I wouldn't even have to show up at work, and they'd have been happier to pay me if I wouldn't have come around. And I was mad because these two trainees got my job, and they wouldn't ask me any questions. So I'm, I'm sitting in there one day plotting my revenge against all these people, or either waiting for lunch hour or something so I could go out. And I heard this lady comes running, and she says, where does Joe Chamberlain sit? The other lady says, that son of a bitch sits over there. <laughs> and if you, uh, you know, that hurts. And if you don't have to talk to him, don't. She says, what's the matter with him? He's spring-loaded in a pissed-off position. He doesn't like anybody or anything. And that was my attitude, and I wasn't aware of it. And that hurt. But it was a good excuse to go out and cry in some drinks. But you know, the time, I'm missing it again. Same thing, I'm hiding in the bedrooms. And I finished up what I say is a martini drinker at an 8-ounce or 10-ounce glass, half full of wine and half full of vodka. And I couldn't get drunk, and I couldn't get sober, and I couldn't pass out, and I couldn't stand up, I couldn't sit down. And when I came to again, I'm in a padded cell back in the psych ward. And I was really scared. Because the thought occurred to me that if I'm not an alcoholic, what am I doing back in here? And I realized, what am I going to do? Is this going to be my life in and out of these psych wards until I die? Because I was completely burned out. I was 46 years old then. I figured my life was over. And I'm going to go in and out of these things until I die sometime later. And you know, I don't know if you've ever been incarcerated in by the way, the only one that never got a pass in two trips to that psych ward was me. They let them nuts run all over Stanford and Stanford Shopping Center, but me, the drunk, they wouldn't let out unless I had escorts. That I still, it still burns me up. But I'm starting to feel better, and I'm trying to think, how the hell can I get out of this place? Because, you know, they keep dragging you into these rooms, and I never had the right answers. I couldn't do role play. I flunked that, and they didn't want me in the clay class, I wasn't very good at that. The only thing they let me do is cook. They liked the way I cooked breakfast. But I wanted to get out. And I didn't know how. And they dragged me in there. And if you've been there, if you go in and they're all staff, and you're the only client or patient or whatever they call us, you know who the subject's going to be. And I don't know about you, 16 years and nine, almost nine months sober, and I still have black and white fever. And I can get scared if I see the cop going on the other way in the opposite direction. I says, I hope he doesn't see me. And here they are. What are you going to do about your drinking? What are you going to do about your drinking? I really had no idea what I was going to do. I just, you know. And I said, if I don't find some way to be content within myself, I'll probably never be able to quit. And the one lady that I didn't have bullshit that says, you better go to Alcoholics Anonymous. We all hear of it, but who thinks to go there? I agreed to go to get out of the hospital. I never really intended to go. But for my ex-wife's credit, she went out and found out all about Al-Anon and found out about Alcoholics Anonymous. And the minute that they said he should go to Alcoholics, she already had a phone number for me to call. And I talked to a guy, and he was 22, and four years sober in 1972. That was really rare. But, you know, I was talking to that guy, but he didn't tell me what to do. He wasn't saying you got to do this and you got to do that. He was only telling me what he did. And I told him how scared I was inside and the fear of being found out and all of these things. And the only thing he says is me too. He agreed with the, how I felt inside. And all my life, people have been telling me what to do and when to do it and how to do it. This guy never told me anything. He just I never even met the guy. I just talked to him on the phone. And I finally... Agreed to go to the meeting. They let me out of the place. And I'm still looking for that magic answer. If I'd have walked into the Lakewood meeting in Sunnyvale 
and somebody would have handed me some and said, take this mister, you won't have to go in there, how to take it and ran. And it was like I said earlier, they're talking about God and freeways and the birds and the bees. And it's the longest hour I've ever put in my life. And that's all I'm doing is staring at my watch and wishing this was over and boy am I sorry I ever came to this thing. Because if life don't work, this ain't going to work either. And I was really obsessed with that life don't work for certain people so there's no sense in trying anyway. And they call on a guy who's about the age I am now. He's a beat up old senior master sergeant who served in three wars and he looked at he was rough and rough and What's that old bastard going to be able to tell me? That's what the thoughts are going in my mind. But you know, he said something that saved my life. He says, Alcoholics Anonymous is something you do for yourself. And it never occurred to me to do anything for me. I was always trying these things for some other reason and it never worked. He says, you do it for yourself. You go to the meetings and you listen to how the people are getting better. Don't waste no time on how they're staying sick. Just listen to how they're getting better. And if it makes any sense to you, give it some value and put it in your life. And then he even gave me a prayer that if I don't drink, no matter what, things will get better. You know, I used to go in the bathroom and put the seat down, turn the fan on, close the door, and just pound on my legs and keep saying that. If I don't drink, no matter what, things will get better. And I had to learn how to read all over again. I start out with that little pamphlet just for today. And every time I'd be gripped with this feeling, it ain't going to work. Nothing works. So why are you going through all of this? Why don't you just forget it? I pick out that little pamphlet and I keep reading it. Especially that part about don't be afraid. You know, watch haste and indecision. Especially that don't let your feelings get hurt. And try to take a little time each day just to think about things. And I would think about AA might work. And then be gripped with that again, and it ain't going to work. And then I keep going to the meetings. So I didn't really want to go anymore, but these goddamn guys kept showing up and taking me. You know, whether I wanted to go or not, they were there. And I was still pretty shy and scared about everything. I didn't know how to tell them I wasn't really wanting to go. And then you, it's like I said, you keep on keeping on till you catch on. The thing I was wondering about is when am I going to see something in my life that this program is going to work? And I couldn't see it, and I couldn't see it, but I kept going. And finally we came up to a three-day weekend. And you know, when you get a three days, man, this is, you think you're going to be off three months with all the plans you make just for that one extra day. And you rush out of work, and this one lady says to me, what are you going to do to unwind? And I stopped dead in my tracks and realized I wasn't wound up. And I had been wound up so long, and it was, this was in about 80 or 90 days. I was not wound up. And from that day to this day, I've never questioned that the program of Alcoholics Anonymous works. Because I know it works, because in my own life, I could see that, just that little thing. So, by the way, if you're ever worried about having a spiritual experience, if you ever told anybody else AA works, you already had it. And you just build on it from there. But one of the guys that I used to call sponsors was Father Barney, and he never talked unless he talked about the steps. And that is the program. Because the steps are there so that you can find out who you are, what you are, and you can accept what you find there and live completely without alcohol. So you have to uncover, discover, and discard any way you want to say it. And like the first three steps is he can't, I can't, he can, I think I'll let him. And I, you know, the part of being an alcoholic, after you've admitted a lot of times you get out of trouble and you almost die of it and you have two, two sessions in the psych ward, it isn't too hard to accept the fact. But the way I did it would go to the mirror and keep repeating that I'm an alcoholic till the man in the mirror looked back at me and then that's how I accepted it. I could not understand how can your life be unmanageable if you're not a, a non-participant in life. If you're just existing and you're just you're just there, you know, it's like living in a bubble with all these other five people. I didn't know them and they didn't know me. How can your life be unmanageable? And I heard it for 
I probably heard it on the tape or read it in the grapevine or something. And life inside of me was unmanageable. I did not know how a human being should should live. I had no idea how to function as a parent, a co-worker, a husband, a friend. I had no idea what that was. Because I thought if you treat everybody nice and buy all their friendships and do everything they want, that was being what they wanted, and it wasn't. So I had to learn how to manage my own life from the inside out. And I had a lot of problem with the word sanity because I thought it tracked to insanity, but it doesn't. Sanity has nothing to do with insanity. You give your cat some booze, it's going to do crazy things. Everybody does crazy things when they're drugged, either with alcohol or anything else. And I went down to the library with one of the editors from the department I worked in, and we tracked it. And sanity means wholeness. Make me whole again. Make my thinking healthy. Make me to the point where that I can think reasonable and function. You know, I think it's the way it was that if I can function according to reason, then I've been restored to sanity because then my mind is clear. And the insane part is after you've found the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and you realize there's another another way to live than the way you were living, you pick up the drink that would start you on the next round of drinking. That's insane. Because once you find a better way to live. But that's what I want to be. I want to be whole. And then in the third step, you know, it's just the care of God. You just have to make a decision. And I went back to the mirror until I kept looking at that person. And the person in the mirror one day looked back at me. I did turn it over in the care of it. It's just like you take your check and you give it to the bank. You just don't say, hey, bank, here's the check. you got to take that thing home, and then you got to take the deposit slip and mark it in your checkbook. And you got to keep track of the checks that you write so that you know what your balance is. And that's the care of, and that's about the way you do it. You know, you can't keep writing checks just because you got checks left. you got to make sure that you got money in there to cover them. Like, I used to steal the checks out of the back of my wife's thing, and then they would all come back, unrecognizable signature. I had no idea where I cashed them or for how much money. There were always bouncing checks all over the place. But the third step, if you make the decision to turn your life and your will over to the care of God, what's God's will for you is to take the rest of the steps. If you don't make the third step, and get the care of God to do the fourth step, you'll never be able to find out what these defects are and what you have left to build a a life on. You know, the people who wrote this program had some real insight because they realized your secrets will keep you sick. And bugs lead to booze. So if you've got secrets and you've got things bugging you, you better go dump them. I don't care who you dump them with, but you got to dump them. And once you expose them, that's what that searching means. You turn the searchlight on that stuff, and it will dissipate. Once it's out in the open, it, it isn't the big mystery that you're keeping locked up inside. Then you can take the inventory and find out what your character defects are. And then the fifth step, there were things that occurred to me. Oh, by the way, I had to take the fourth step. If you can't write, how you do an inventory? By the time I think of the word, look up the spelling, get it down, I forgot what I was going to say anyway. So I kept going back and forth, and thank God for the al They got a sheet that says debit and credit, and it's 35 items on each side. So all I had to do was go down and X those things, honestly, and go talk to somebody about them. So what I thought was right about me was wrong, and what I thought was wrong was right. So it was an easy one to take, but I still didn't tell them intend to tell people, especially by giving all these people raises and taking all these trips where they weren't needed and all these things. Made a trip to Salinas with some other people and only one person showed up. It was just this lady and I going down to a speaker meeting from some guy from our area. And we started talking and about halfway down I realized I just told that woman everything I said I'd never tell anybody. I had did my fifth step. When the opportunity presented itself and I was ready, and I didn't even know it. 
So on the way back from Salinas, I heard her fist up. So it was great. We both got our fist steps done. But the minute, you know, they talk about the relief that you find and you go and get the quiet. The relief I felt was I really told somebody my deep, dark secrets. I really told people what was really bugging me. And I told some things to her that I'll probably never tell anybody else. Because by revealing some of the things I told her, probably could hurt my kids. And I wouldn't want to do that. And then the sixth and seventh step, we identified them, you know, and this is the cause and the effect. The effect is the character effect. The cause is the shortcoming. You keep coming up short, people keep telling you about it, you know these character defects are going to come back. And I'm just as powerless over my character defects as I am over the first drink. I had thought, once you find out what they are, you never have a problem with them anymore. But that isn't what it turns out to be. The sixth and seventh F says God's going to give you an opportunity to grow. You know, if your patience is your character defect, the thing that he's going to give you is a lot of things that make you lose your patience until you learn what the lesson is. You know, if you're willing to have God remove your character defects, you have to be ready for the opportunities. And I get them all the time. And this here procrastination and irresponsibility comes back all the time. And I made the list of all the persons I had harmed, and the one I forgot to put on the list was me. Because I can't really accept everything about me unless I'm willing to forgive me. So I had to put my name on top of the list and forgive me before I could go and say to other people the things that I did and I was sorry I did them. Because if I've never forgiven myself for that guilt, I could never really mean it when I said that. And since I was a non-participant in life, there wasn't many things that I really did. Mine were mostly being not involved, and it turns out irresponsibility. So how do you make amends for all this irresponsible behavior? You make indirect amends. And one way I do that is be involved in the hospital institution committee. I've been going to jails and hospitals since I've been almost three months sober, and I still do two meetings a month. And as long as I keep doing the meetings, I feel like I'm working on my amends. And that's a good feeling. Even like coming way up here, I like to punch Dale in the nose for inviting me sometimes. How can you get out of it after you say And then it occurs to me, you have to do what you're asked to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then you find out more about the go giving. You come back and you guide them. You know that the tenth step about to continue to take personal inventory. I never did really. In, I don't know about you, but I don't like to make amends. I don't like to promptly admit it when I'm wrong. Especially now I'm remarried and I don't like to tell her I'm ever wrong. <laughs> But you have to do these things because you've learned by this time that you have a conscience. And if you're not doing your steps properly, your conscience is going to idiot you. And one of the best ways to continue to take personal inventory is go to a meeting. You know, where we can come in here and match our scorecard. And you're going to hear something at a meeting that's going to set you off on another tangent, another way that you can take an inventory. And the thing that I like about it now is all in diamond nickel compromises I've made all my life just don't pile up anymore. I can stay current. I don't have to keep letting that stuff pile up. And it's very easy. If you've done something wrong, your gut is going to tell you that uneasiness that you get. Now, the prime example of that is I, when Hoppy was still alive, we were always swapping tapes back and forth. And I had these tapes, and he said, get them back right away. So... I run over to the post office in our company and told the little girl to weigh them. I want to know how much money. It's against her rules. I said, I don't give a shit. It's against your rules. I want to mail these things. Tell me how much. And I forced her into doing it. And I get back to my office and I felt about that big. She's, you know, and then I call her and I start apologizing. She says, well, I didn't realize who you were. I said, I don't care who I was. If you have a rule that's put down there, I have no right bulldozing you into to doing that. You know, and she could not understand what I was trying to do when I was saying, I'm sorry that I did that. 
And she was very embarrassed by the apology. So I said, well, that's all right. You can be embarrassed, but I have to do this for me. And I'm very sorry that I did that. And then in the 11th step, I think a uh, 24-hour book, and I got, uh, as Bill sees it, and a couple other uh, daily word in the upper room, and I read these little things, and I think about it. And my wife and I read the daily word together, and my day goes better when I remember to do that. Then I also remember on that step, you can plug in any time. You just don't have to do it in the morning and your day starts out shitty. You get caught off on the freeway. Or like this morning, some lady lost a camper and a truck rolled over and all the lanes are blocked. And I'm 31 miles from work and I'm saying, what the hell? Let's go home, do this. Plug back in and start praying. And my prayers are very simple. It's the light to see and the strength to do. That's all I'm praying for, the light to see and the strength to do. I just want knowledge of his will. And his will for me is just to build a better Joe. That's what God's will is for me, just to build a better person. And if you're working these steps and you're praying and seeking this, you're going to get all kind of opportunities to build a better you. And I I love the feeling of that self-satisfaction that I talked about earlier. I love that feeling inside. That as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, I am doing God's will. And God's will for me is nothing but to love. I have to love all the people involved in my life. Even the people I don't like, I have to love them. And I have to get along with them. And if I can remember that. And then at night, the simple prayer is just thanks. I just have to thank them. Because I think Alcoholics Anonymous has given me a second chance at life. And I think back on the first 46 years before I got here, sometimes I wonder if I ever had the first chance. I really don't, I really don't think I had. I didn't have anything to work with until I came here. And it's like you're in a ball game and you've tied up the game and all of a sudden God comes and says, okay, the game's all tied up. We're going to start this thing all over. I'm going to give you some new rules. I'll be your manager, and I'm going to give you a whole room full of coaches. And you just start playing that game over, but play it according to the rules. And as long as I seek through prayer and meditation what his will for me is, I think I'm playing the game according to the rules. As long as the game saves time, I'm okay. I have a chance of winning. You know, the the spiritual awakening, I I talked about that one I had about uh, not being wound up. But another one I had was, as I started back working, I did not tell anybody that I was an Alcoholics Anonymous. But I took a whole week off to move, and I got all these guys to move, because I had the idea if we move out of that Salvation Early Goodwill type house and get them in a little townhouse with a pool, I'll make amends to everybody, new furniture. The only one I wanted to move was me. I don't know where I got the idea the other people wanted to move. I didn't find out that many months later. But, you know, we moved in that first five hours. We moved one house full of furniture into another house. Had it all set up. My ex-wife went shopping. By the time she got to the new house, she just had to put the groceries away. And not one item was broke. I can remember moving before where I'd be a whole week moving and I'd still be in the first house. And everything that got to the second house would be ruined and there'd be nothing but fights. You know, I'd start out to do an errand and end up at the beer parlor to get a little encouragement and stay there all day. And, you know, then now I lost my train of thought. I started thinking about the dumb move. But there was a difference. And the boss came on when I got back from this move and knocked on my cubicle. And I looked around to see who he was talking to. I said, what do you want? There ain't anybody in here but me. He said, no, I came to talk to you. Why? I missed you. There was something different about you. And he says, can we go have some coffee? And we get down there and we start talking. And we're done with the coffee break. And we start back upstairs. And the thought of passed my mind. I said, oh, shit. i got to tell him now what the difference is. And I walked into his office and closed the door and told him he better sit down. And then I told him the story. And as a result of that, he ended up crying that I thought that much of him. And then we went from 
there he, he says about a week later, you go work with my boss and do something. And then I met another guy in AA at a meeting, and he said, let's do something at the company. And I'll listen. You know, the people didn't understand what we did. But instead of rushing to Mahogany Row and swearing at everybody the way I used to, I told everybody that I was going. And when I came back, I told them what happened. And I got all our literature out, you know, the employer. And I'm trying to tell this man. He keeps saying, never mind. It's not necessary. Never mind. It's not necessary. Sometimes he's a member. And I was the only guy at the company that knew it. And that, that gave me chills. And every time something special come up, I got the job. And that, that spiritual awakening. But you know, there, there's a lot more to the step. You know, carrying the message, you can carry it all kind of ways. Just by showing up tonight and helping putting the food out and things like that. I try to make my life like the other channel. It's all one big 12-step call. Because, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous is not what you do here in the meetings. It's what you do between the meetings. We're just in here nurturing one another, but it's what you do between the meetings. And that's what I try to do at work. Sometimes I get to work and there's no room in my cubicle for me. Everybody just always gravitates to the thing, whether I'm in there or not, because that's where they want to be. But I think the hardest part of the 12 step and of the whole program is practicing the principles in all your affairs. And I have a beautiful wife that I met where I was working. We were married five years. Oh, by the way, on our fifth anniversary, my ex-wife made the cake. Because my one daughter was married the week before, my other daughter was married the week after, and there was another kid I have a daughter in AA, and she met some guy, and they got married, I guess, just about now. So she made one big anniversary because everybody was in from out of town. And there I have a picture of my ex-wife with my wife walking down the street with my two grandkids. Now, where else but in Alcoholics Anonymous could you see that? <laughs> they are the best of friends, and it's a, it's a miracle, you know. But practicing the principles... One of the character defects is I have, because our program tells us the only perfect thing you do in Alcoholics Anonymous is don't drink. Everything else is progress. A perfect set of ideas that you work toward. But how come when somebody's working for me, I expect them to be perfect, and I know I'm not? And I have to go back and apologize. And why do I keep expecting that? Everybody else has to be perfect. This wife and I can sit down on the couch, discuss what we're going to do in the yard. I'll go out the back door, and she'll go out the front door. I'm working over here, and she's working over there. We just had sat there for a half hour and decided. So you know, I have to tell her, you know, your thoughts never crossed my mind. If you wanted me in the front yard, you should have said something. Because when she says mound, I see the one by the driveway. She sees the one on the other side. It goes on that way all the time. But it ultimately comes down to one, one simple fact. Everybody has to tend to their own garden. You know, I can't put my nose in your garden if I still got weeds in mine. I have to keep my garden, and that's a full-time job. And if I want what I said in the beginning to realize that I am responsible for my own inner development, and the only way I can keep that flame going is by tending to my own garden. You know, I'd love to be able to tell my wife what to do and how to do it and all these things. And She has a way of keeping books that I think is screwy, but it always comes out right. So if that's the way she wants to do it, let her do it. See, we have the freedom to be apart, but yet we're together. You have the freedom to be yourself. I have to let everybody be themselves. And as a result, I had four kids that never wanted to see me again, and today we've got a great relationship. They include my wife and I, and we've had three Christmases where we're all together and things like that. But if I wasn't tending to my own things, I had a lot of trouble with the number four daughter when I was getting remarried because she, you know, I was out of the house six years before I met this girl or this lady. She thought I was away for the weekend and I'd still be coming home. And once she found out, she wrote me seven and eight page scathing letters. Everything you could think was in there. And I just put, I'm sorry you feel that way, but I have a right to be a person too. Put in the envelope and mail it back. I had to do that three or four times before she caught on that just because she rang her bell that 
I am not. I am not. There isn't anything in the world that I am obligated to respond to. There isn't anything in the world that says if you attack me, I have to react. If you don't respond, you don't react, you don't receive. And the person who's trying to dump on you, they're stuck with it. And I learned all of this by working the steps and finding out who and what I am and accepting it. But the main thing is keep my nose in my own garden. And my garden's full of weeds all the time. You know, I heard Father Martin say that one time he wouldn't want his best day shown on the screen. I wouldn't even want my best hour shown there. Every thought, every deed, everything. Like that little girl comes in to ask a question. And I say, Not again. Can't you see I'm reading the sports page? You know, I'm paid to do the job. By the way, I'll be 63 years old in another month, and I just got promoted. $3,500 a year raise. Got three people working for me. I'm making probably more money than I ever thought was possible. I was laid off after 23 years and 10 months at a company when I was 58 and a half. And I found this other job. And it, everything has just been going great. They keep, I'm an autonomous operation. Nobody ever says what you're doing, what's that. And I still don't want to do the work. You know what I want to do? I want to go over to the word processor and play around and learn new things on that. Even if it has nothing to do with work. I want to go play with that thing. And the other guy's got a uh, uh, IBM or a Macintosh. I can hear him playing game. I want to do that stuff. I don't want to do the job. You know, I'm the only one that does the proposals. I want somebody else to do it. You know, I want to come around and pick it up and get all the credit, but I don't want to do the work. And I have to keep coming back to that same thing. What, you know, what are you doing? You're not paying attention. So I have to lecture myself. I just, you know, sometimes the only time I got left is to procrastinate. And I love procrastinating. I won't wait to do the quote till the guillotine is coming down. And if it ain't done by 3 o'clock, we're going to lose the contract. Then I'll start working. I've had it for a month. And I still do those things. But it all comes, but you know, if you wait just a little bit, the answers will come can take a couple of deep breaths and I can plug back in and then I can answer the girl's questions and then I can do the quote. And I don't have to be claustic and give smart answers. And a lot of times I'm asked by different people. You know, I tell them, I went from living all them impossible dreams to living the possible dream because of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But they keep asking me, how do you know the program works? Well, God knows I ain't what I ought to be. God knows I ain't what I'm going to be. God knows I sure ain't what I want to be. But thank God I ain't what I used to be. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much. 